explosions, giant monsters, and the brave heroes fighting against them. All this and more on tonight's episode of Super Justice Containment Action Squadron. Stay tuned, kids. It's a beautiful evening in downtown Kyoto, Japan. People are hustling and bustling to and fro, all focused on whatever the night will hold for them. A late dinner with friends, perhaps, a bit of live music, a quiet night at home watching TV on the couch. Certainly, no one has planned for what is about to happen, but life scarcely goes how we plan, and ready or not, something is coming. All at once, the earth begins to shake, but not an earthquake, that steady roll and shake, a sporadic rumble, boom, 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 the stomping of giant footsteps, then they stop. Whatever was coming, it's here now. The people freeze in their tracks, looking around frantically, and see a giant metal cat standing on two legs, holding a massive pastel pink sword. How do you like meow? Quake with fear, tiny fools, for it is I, Commander Kitty Boo Boo, here to make this world my litter box, and no one will stand in my way. Panicked, people begin to scatter, running out of the monstrous kitty cat's path. Will no one save them? Is there no hope? Commander Kitty Boo Boo lifts one massive paw, pink claws glittering with malice, and swipes at a nearby building. Rubble crashes to the ground, thankfully just barely missing any nearby civilians by mere inches. See proof of my power? Claws of fury! The cat swipes again, bringing down another building. It seems that doom has come to Kyoto today. But wait, what's that? Up there, on that tall building just behind Commander Kitty Boo Boo. Why, it's four confused-looking people in brightly colored costumes. Two young men wearing yellow and orange respectively, a young woman with glasses wearing blue, and a middle-aged woman with her hair tied up in a ponytail wearing red. All of them looking utterly bewildered at the predicament they find themselves in. But the giant cat takes notice of this band of strangers, turning to face them. Ah, the so-called heroes think they can best me? That's a laugh? Ha! I am no mere house cat. Feast your eyes on this! Strings of destruction attack! From seemingly nowhere, the cat produces a giant ball of string, throwing it at the four. The woman in red throws up her arms in an instinctive defensive posture, and from her forearms, bursts of bright red light shoot out, slicing the string to ribbons. Commander Kitty Boo Boo reels back in shock. The laser scissors technique? But how? What sort of powers do you possess? The woman simply shrugs in response. No matter. I can counter that perfectly. Time for a hurricane hairball! The cat takes a deep breath, then makes a hideous hacking sound before spitting a ball of bright pink hair toward the heroes. In a burst of inspiration, the young man in yellow responds by running toward the projectile, leaping into the air, and delivering a flying kick. The kick collides with the hairball, emitting yellow sparks, and sending the hairball shooting back toward Commander Kitty Boo Boo. How can this be? The forbidden lightning kick? But surely, none of you know. My secret weakness. You couldn't possibly. At the mention of a weakness, the group of strangers forms a huddle. They didn't expect to be defending the city this evening, but they might as well try and rise to the occasion. So, what might a cat's weakness be? A dog? No, they don't have one on hand. Wait, what about... The girl in blue rushes to the front of the group, throwing out her arms in front of her like she's splashing someone in a swimming pool. From nowhere, a wave of water flies through the air, soaking Commander Kitty Boo Boo from its enormous head to its giant feet. No! How could you know? My plan was perfect! Get me out of here! The giant cat turns and begins to flee the city, running back the way it came. As it departs, there is an enormous puff of red smoke, and it vanishes without a trace. Well, aside from the extensive property damage left in its wake. There, on the top of that tall building, the four strangers are still standing, still dressed in their bizarre costumes. None of them know how they got there, and they're not exactly sure how to get down either. Thankfully, there are dozens of grateful civilians eager to help them out of their predicament. Every one of them has hundreds of questions, mainly regarding who they are and how they found themselves battling a giant monster in the middle of the city tonight. Not a single one of them can say they were all minding their own business in a nearby shopping mall, picking up a few things, when there was a sudden fog of bright red smoke. And when the smoke cleared, they were on top of the building and staring down a giant cat. 
but now the moment has passed and they can celebrate a job well done. Meanwhile, the Japanese division of the SCP Foundation is scrambling to determine what just happened here and how they can prevent it from happening again. Their search takes them to a novelty store in that shopping mall, where they discover an object that is quickly taken into custody and designated SCP-3596. SCP-3596 is a 4-meter-long sarcophagus-like object made from brightly colored ABS plastics. The base is yellow, and the sides and top are decorated with red, blue, and green pieces, as well as a smattering of lights and speakers. The lid also includes a label printed with Japanese script, which translates to Super Justice Containment Action Squadron. In the center of the lid, there is a 20 cm by 8 cm television screen. Some anomalous objects are quite unpredictable, often deliberately so. SCP-3596 is not one of them. It operates on a precise schedule, activating every other Saturday at exactly 8.30 a.m. EST in what the Foundation has termed a Nakajima event. These events consist of the following. First, all of the lights and speakers on the sarcophagus will activate for a duration of 30 seconds while the television screen displays the words, Up Next, Super Justice Containment Action Squadron, in a brightly colored, cartoonish font. Next, a cloud of colorful smoke, usually a primary color, will appear around the object. The smoke is thick enough to obscure the object from view, but it does not appear to be toxic in any way. One researcher assigned to the anomaly reported that it smelled like his favorite childhood breakfast cereal, though this report is unconfirmed. When the smoke clears, SCP-3596 will no longer be in its chosen containment chamber. But that's not all. SCP-3596 doesn't just vanish in a puff of smoke, it teleports to a semi-random location in Japan along with a group of people known as SCP-3596-2. Put a pin in that, more on them later. When SCP-3596 reappears in its new location, it is always within a 7km radius of a major city and will appear in an elevated position. It reappears in that same cloud of smoke as before. Then, the lid flips open and a lightning bolt strikes the inside regardless of the weather conditions. A 50-meter plume of colorful smoke and sparks flies out of the object, and then, when the smoke clears, a giant monster or armored warrior is standing in its place. This entity is known as SCP-3596-1 and varies from event to event. The majority of them are bipedal humanoids, standing at a height between 25 and 30 meters. The largest instance on record measures 36 meters tall. Most of them wear heavily decorated armor with helmets or masks and hold heavily decorated weapons as well. They may also have wings or tails or multiple sets of arms. Recorded instances of SCP-3596-1 have included a 31-meter-tall, four-armed red entity wearing a metallic breastplate, helmet, and boots, as well as oversized shoulder pads. The helmet included a visor which covered the eyes and mouth and two horns on either side of its head. Another recorded instance was an enormous orange and green figure wearing a giant pumpkin on its head, while another was a 30-meter-tall purple woman with a helmet shaped like a masquerade ball mask. Witnesses who see these entities up close have described them as a little cheap-looking and kind of silly, as well as like something out of a kid's show. Hey, everyone's a critic. After manifesting, the instance of SCP-3596-1 will monologue, usually for about 40 seconds. The content varies but tends to involve a declaration of intent to conquer the land, destroy the city, or defeat some heroes. There's always a great deal of confidence in the speech and a certainty that their evil plan will prevail. If not drawn into a fight with nearby SCP-3596-2 instances, the entity will begin moving toward the nearest city, destroying any structures in its path. Notably, no human casualties have ever occurred as a result of this, even when statistically improbable or even seemingly impossible. Any witnesses caught in the crossfire are always miraculously unharmed, not a scratch on them. 30 minutes following the start of the Nakajima event, the SCP-3596-1 instance will declare its defeat at the hands of the heroes, regardless of what has actually taken place. It will then threaten revenge in one way or another, then disappear in another colorful cloud of smoke. At this point, the television screen on SCP-3596 will display a message in that same cartoonish font, featuring the date of the next Nakajima event and the words, Tune in next time. So what was that about SCP-3596-2? Well, that brings us back to those heroes that SCP-3596-1 instances are always going on about. 
During any given Nakajima event, three to six individuals will be chosen as instances of SCP-3596-2. These individuals are different each time, but must be within a 0.8 kilometer radius of SCP-3596 at the time of its activation. Individuals selected as SCP-3596-2 instances always fall within at least one of the following categories. A physically fit male who was enrolled in any form of sports team between the ages of 12 to 18, a person wearing a baseball cap backwards, a woman with hair done in a ponytail at the time of the Nakajima event, a person who wears glasses and achieved academic honors between the ages of 12 and 18, a male of African-American descent, a person of Asian descent, a person who bears any level of resentment for any other current SCP-3596-2 instance, a dog, a person who has trained in any form of martial arts between the ages of 12 and 18, or a person wearing an outfit at least 60% comprised of a single primary or secondary color. These chosen individuals will be teleported along with SCP-3596. Once they have reached the location, appearing in a puff of smoke, they will find themselves suddenly wearing brightly colored lycra bodysuits decorated with eye-catching patterns or other additional elements and reinforced with Kevlar. They have been chosen by the anomaly and will play the part of the heroes for the next 30 minutes until the Nakajima event has concluded. All Nakajima events are recorded by the Foundation, but most of the transcripts are highly classified. I was, however, able to access one of them. Incident N-3596-04 I've summarized the events of the transcript to the best of my ability, and I hope it paints a vivid picture of how these events tend to go. The Nakajima event began as it always does, with the fanfare and cheerful blinking lights of SCP-3596, followed by the characteristic cloud of smoke. This time, the smoke was bright blue. Three Foundation personnel also vanished in the cloud of blue smoke, D-00852, Researcher Thompson, and Researcher Kells. When the three reappeared on a hilltop in the Nagano Prefecture, they were dressed quite differently than before. D-00852's orange jumpsuit had transformed into an orange lycra bodysuit. Researcher Thompson's blue slacks had changed into a blue bodysuit, and Researcher Kell's green sweater and socks had become a bodysuit in the same shade of green. In front of them, an instance of SCP-3596 manifested. It was a bipedal humanoid, standing at a height of 27 meters. It was covered with pale blue scales and had a rubbery, fish-like appearance. There were gills on the sides of its neck and large fins all along its body. Its fingers and toes were webbed, and it was clad in a long green cape with spikes around its collar. In its hand, it carried an 18-meter-long spear. The spearhead was sculpted into the shape of an anatomically incorrect fish skeleton, resembling those pictures in children's cartoons. The three chosen SCP-3596-2 instances turned around just as the massive fish creature began to laugh loudly. It opened its mouth again and declared in a booming voice, The ocean now walks on land, and you, Super Justice Containment Action Squadron, will never stop me, for I am Gil Munra, the champion of the sea. The three humans were understandably terrified by the sight of the enormous beast, and researcher Kells screamed, running in the opposite direction as fast as he could. Gil Munra took great delight in the sight of this, calling out, Yes, run in terror. Take this. Flying Barracuda Strike. At this point, Gil Munra leaped forward, extending one leg into a kick. Researcher Kells, frozen in fear, suddenly curled up into a ball of distress. When he did, a translucent green barrier manifested in the air around him and his teammates. Gil Munra's kick collided uselessly with the force field, ricocheting off, and knocking the fish creature into a grove of trees further down the hill. As it collapsed onto the trees, its weight crushed them with a deafening crash. Curses! The cowering tortoise technique! Gil Munra cried out. No matter, for Gil Munra is not so easily bested. Let's see you block the sea dragon's breath! Gil Munra inhaled, chest puffing out as it took a deep breath. Then, it shot a stream of high-pressure water out of its mouth, directing it toward the squad. Researcher Thompson and D-00852 managed to think fast and dragged the still-cowering researcher Kells with them down the nearby hill. They rolled down the grassy slope and out of the path of the water, which stripped the grass from the dirt on impact. 
After buying themselves a bit of time, Researcher Thompson shifted into problem-solving mode. She turned to Researcher Kells, asking him if he had any ideas on how to stop the entity from causing any more collateral damage. D00852 suggested that they try to dry it out somehow, since the creature was a fish. Researcher Thompson brushed this proposal off, suggesting that if the sun hadn't done anything by now, there was nothing they could do that would be more effective in drying the fish. While making her point, Researcher Thompson gestured toward the sky, toward the sun in particular. When she did, the sunlight suddenly brightened, intensifying until a beam of light shot down from the sky toward her hand, bouncing off of her hand and hitting Gil Munra. The beast was just beginning to approach, but the sudden beam of light collided with it, knocking it back a bit. Notably, it did not appear actually hurt. Still, Gil Munra suddenly declared, Yarg! The drying sun lance! How did you figure out my weakness? Gil Munra shall return! The ocean will have its revenge. It turned and ran toward a large nearby pond before diving in. Just before its body hit the water, it vanished in a cloud of that same blue smoke. The Nakajima event was over, leaving the three chosen SCP-3596-2 instances sitting on the grass in their colorful bodysuits. D-00852 broke the silence, asking, Is this, uh, the part where we tell kids to stay in school? Any special abilities gained by SCP-3596-2 instances during a given Nakajima event vanish once the event has concluded. Therefore, researchers Kells and Thompson were no longer able to summon force fields or channel the power of the sun after Gil Munra's defeat. They returned back to Foundation Site 26 with SCP-3596 in tow. As usual, the television screen read, Tune in next time. The special containment procedures for SCP-3596 are as follows. After each Nakajima event concludes, SCP-3596 is to be brought back to Foundation Site 26 in an undisclosed region of Japan. Every Saturday, from 8 to 10 EST, any news, messages, satellite images, and phone calls sent from Japan must be screened for mentions of SCP-3596. If any mentions are detected, they are to be censored. Any civilians who witness a Nakajima event in person are to be given amnestics immediately after its conclusion. The Japanese military may not be allowed to engage with SCP-3596-1 instances, and communication blocking may be employed in order to prevent them from doing so. When SCP-3596-1 instances manifest, they must be lured away from populated areas by Foundation personnel and SCP-3596-2 instances. Proceedings should be kept as non-violent as possible, using minimal weaponry. Site-26 must maintain a large supply of building materials and cloaking cognito hazards in order to repair damage caused by SCP-3596-1 instances during Nakajima events without inviting any questions from witnesses or the media. If anything slips through the cracks, cover stories involving earthquakes or construction projects may be employed. In order to keep civilians from being chosen as instances of SCP-3596-2, at least 12 Foundation personnel that meet the requirements for the anomaly must be at Site-26 at all times. As part of this procedure, all on-site personnel at Site-26 must be fully briefed on the nature of SCP-3596. Now that I've gone over all of the containment procedures, I should mention they may not be relevant any longer, not since the most recent Nakajima event. On one sunny June day, the 32nd Nakajima event occurred. This particular event was different from all the ones before. All at once, every previous instance of SCP-3596-1 manifested in the center of an undisclosed Japanese city. 28 Foundation personnel were selected as SCP-3596-2 instances, transported to the same city in colorful jumpsuits for the grandest battle yet. For an unprecedented 58 minutes, dozens of giant monsters stomped through the city, smashing various buildings to rubble. As usual, no civilians or personnel were hurt in the process, though the property damage was quite expansive and expensive. Transcripts of the specific event are classified to any without level 3 clearance, but I can imagine it was an action-packed spectacular and a hell of a series finale. You see, after the event concluded, there was no message on SCP-3596's television screen. No tune in next time or anything else like it. Instead, the lid of the structure unlocked. Inside, there were six neatly folded bodysuits, identical to those that always appeared on instances of SCP-3596-2. 
Each bodysuit was a different color and came with matching helmets, boots, and gloves. Curiously, all bodysuits and helmets were emblazoned with the SCP Foundation logo. In addition to these uniforms, there was a single photograph at the bottom of SCP-3596. It depicted a group of smiling, laughing Asian men, each wearing a costume corresponding to a previous instance of SCP-3596-1, except for the helmets or masks, which they held in their hands. On the back of the photograph, there was a message. Thank you for being in our show. Super Justice Containment Action Squadron forever. There have been no Nakajima events since this occurrence. The individuals in the photograph have yet to be identified, and I personally doubt they ever will be. As far as I can tell, all previous Nakajima events were episodes of an anomalous television show for children, possibly from some sort of parallel universe to ours. The 32nd event was a finale, an extra-long special, bringing back all the previous villains for one parting showdown. After it was finished, the creative team behind it sent the SCP Foundation the photograph and custom costumes as a little wrap gift, a thank you for all of their hard work on the show. For now, it seems that the story is over. But hey, never rule out a reunion special. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-2484, Parasitic Mayonnaise Worms.